Hi everyone, this is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest. He's the longtime CEO of Memory Dealers. He's also the CEO of Bitcoin.com. He was one of the earliest Bitcoin investors, and he's the first Bitcoin-related business angel investor. And he's uh, provided seed funding for a lot of well-known Bitcoin-related businesses. He's also a major donor to the Foundation for Economic Education, donating Bitcoins to them and helping promote Austrian School Economics and Liberty. Roger Vera, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jason. Now, Roger, since uh, you've moved to Asia, uh, I want to ask you about how much uh, people in Asia, in China, love cryptocurrency. Uh, one of the reasons that the SEC turned down the uh, Bitcoin ETF earlier in the year, I believe in March, was they said that 90% of all the trading volume for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was out of Asia. So do you do you see uh, similar patterns, trading patterns there? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I trade on Asian exchanges. You can trade on exchanges all over the world. Cryptocurrency isn't just an Asian thing. It's a worldwide thing. And it's not just people that are in Asia that are excited about it. It's people on every continent of every race and every sex. Like everybody all over the world is excited about Bitcoin once they, they know and understand it. And cryptocurrencies, you know, thanks to the invention of Bitcoin, are going to improve the lives of everybody on the planet. So I, I think it's a bunch of nonsense for the SEC to say, oh, well, it's a bunch of people over in Asia trading it. Even if that is true, so what? Uh, humans in Asia are just like humans in, in America, too. So if humans in Asia find something useful, humans in, a in the U.S. are going to find it useful, too. And that certainly applies to, to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Yeah, for a 24-hour trading volume, for, for perspective here in the total cryptocurrency market, we now have $8 billion in total trading volume. Pretty impressive numbers. Do you find, though, that through your travels in Asia that more people, uh, boots on the ground, actually know what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are compared to, say, people in the United States, you know, the average American? Um, I think it's getting to be pretty well known all over the world. On some, I, I speak Japanese pretty fluently and... Uh, even in, in, in Japan or, or when I visit other countries in Asia, sometimes if I ask them if they know of Bitcoin, they don't know what I'm talking about. But it's not because uh, they don't know about it. It's because my pronunciation isn't so great in some of those languages. So I think people all over the world know about these things, uh, regardless of, of the country at this point. That's very interesting. Now, China has uh, tried to crack down on initial coin offerings. Uh, I think there's uh, – I've heard you say in other – uh, public discussions and and at uh, and at conferences that you get, I think, over 50 uh, ICO spam emails a day. So uh, do, do you think then that, that this amount of fraud is just going to keep increasing? I don't think that all ICOs are fraud. I think that some ICOs are, are fantastic and some, some are fraud. So it needs to be buyer beware, uh, just like anything on the internet. Now that we have Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that work just like cash, don't go and hand a bunch of your cash over to some stranger that you've never met before on the internet. That's just uh, common sense. And uh, people need to, to, to be wary of those sorts of things. But that isn't to say that ICOs aren't a wonderful thing as a whole. It's basically democratizing venture capital to where now anybody anywhere in the world can invest in any other business anywhere in the world. And, and they can bypass the traditional VC firms and all these things that have traditionally been gatekeepers, these sorts of things. So uh, I'm really excited about ICOs in general. And I've I participated in a few myself, and I probably would have participated in a lot more if I hadn't been so busy as a, the CEO of Bitcoin.com in order to do my due diligence. Uh, I try, I do my best not to hand my money to strangers on the internet. I try and uh, do some research and talk to them and, and learn a bit more. I completely agree with you about being skeptical on these initial coin offerings. I'm a free market guy. I live right outside of Washington, D.C. I've met regulators. Uh, I, you know, Before I became a libertarian after the 2008 financial crisis, I used to hang out with some of them. So I know that you know they don't care. They're not doing their job. And for a lot of people, whether in their technology community or on Wall Street, saying that you know these things need to be more heavily regulated and it'll actually protect people, I completely disagree with. I think, you know, the customer needs to become more educated and they need to become more skeptical and do their own homework like what you said. Yeah, the regulations just protect the incumbent businesses from these upstart competi competing businesses. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, the regulations for the most part are just retarding the rate of economic growth for the entire world. I imagine if Uber hadn't been allowed to start because of stupid regulations and, and they're do, the regulators are doing a lot to, to hinder Uber's adoption. But think about it. The world wouldn't have these wonderfully innovative businesses like Uber and Lyft and uh, Sidecar. And there's a bunch of other ones that make transportation much easier for people all over the world. That's a great thing. Imagine if the regulators had blocked those completely, we wouldn't be able to benefit from any of, the, any of those things. And I'm sure there's all sorts of businesses that have been blocked by regulators and the world doesn't get to benefit from them. And, and you know, capital has been allocated to other things that aren't uh, 
is useful for people around the world. So pretty much any time regulators get involved, they're just hindering businessmen from offering services that people want. And maybe every once in a while, they stop one fraudster from defrauding somebody. But the, the overall net benefit is hugely negative from all these regulations. I completely agree. And great point. Great point about Uber. I mean, Bernie Sanders even likes Uber, but he says it needs to be more regulated. But you look at the examples of all the problems that, uh, you know, whether they're cities like Paris or London have tried to, you know, heavily regulate these things because the taxi cab drivers uh, were making a good living at, 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 uh, at driving taxis. And then Uber has drastically lowered the cost. I know here in Washington, D.C., Uber and Lyft with the competition has drastically lowered the cost of a taxi ride. And I think that's a good thing. Then you have examples examples with like Austin, Texas, where, uh, you know, it's in Texas, Texas is considered a more low, low, low tax, less regulation state. But in Austin, you know, they banned Uber and how like the entrepreneurs there are, are uh, who are not free market capitalists like you and me, they, they even know it's a problem. So uh, it's just funny to see like, you know, the people who say they want more regulation and then the regulation happens and then it causes uh, problems that they didn't expect to happen. Yeah, I think it's as uh, Harry Brown said, government is the problem, not the solution. Amen. Well, now, Roger, I want to transition to Bitcoin Cash. So I had this uh, question for you about since you have a contrarian view on Bitcoin Cash, this was before the huge price spike, because in the last couple of months, I've interviewed Andreas Antonopoulos and Trace Meyer, and they weren't bullish on Bitcoin Cash. Uh, and the reason they said was because there was really only, I think, one developer working on it. So what made you want to accumulate uh, Bitcoin Cash? And are, is there more than one developer working on Bitcoin Cash now? Yeah, there's dozens of developers working on Bitcoin Cash. Um, I would love to have a debate with uh, Trace Mayer or uh, Andreas Antonopoulos on this exact topic. So I started buying Bitcoin Cash uh, right when it first came out, and I bought a bunch of it at around $300, bought more at $400, $500, $600. I've been buying it the whole way up, and uh, it's pulled back a little bit, but I was buying more right before we got on the call here because it's very, very clear. If you have two different versions of Bitcoin, uh, one of which has fast, safe, cheap, reliable transactions, which is Bitcoin Cash. And you have another version of Bitcoin that has super expensive, slow, unreliable transactions, which is Bitcoin Core. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind which one of those two versions of Bitcoin is going to be more successful. And it's Bitcoin Cash. And we're seeing that start to happen. Just uh, earlier today, Blockchain.info, the world's number one Bitcoin wallet uh, in the entire world, announced that they will have 100% complete full support for Bitcoin Cash by the end of this year. It's already November 15th as we're recording this. So that's within 45 days we'll have that. Uh, I think we'll see the same probably from Coinbase and BitPay and uh, Zappo and Circle and Take Your Pick. Uh, every single business around the world that actually uses Bitcoin in payments is scrambling to adopt Bitcoin Cash because it's the most useful version of Bitcoin. And if you don't like it, don't use it. That's fine. If you don't like it, don't buy it. That's just fine. But uh, for those of us that have any common sense and want to use cryptocurrencies in our daily lives and in business, we're going to be buying up Bitcoin Cash like crazy and starting to use it. So, in fact, we're busy porting all of the infrastructure on Bitcoin.com over to Bitcoin Cash uh, because it's simply a more useful, better currency. And it's much more in line with the, the version of Bitcoin that was outlined in the original Satoshi White Paper and the version of Bitcoin that led Bitcoin from uh, its origin to up to about a year ago to being this worldwide phenomenon that it is today. And that was due to fast, cheap, reliable, low-cost transactions. And today... Bitcoin has super expensive, super slow, super unreliable uh, transactions. So it's clear which one businesses are going to use. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind uh, to the point where uh, I've converted a, a large portion of my Bitcoin core holdings into Bitcoin Cash, and I intend to ca convert even more of them. And I listened to your interview on Tom Woods recently, too, where you said, because uh, people ask about what hard forks are, and you, you said they're a software upgrade. Uh, can you explain like the difference in fees between uh, regular Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and maybe also talk about this proposed additional hard fork? Uh, I think there's only two versions of Bitcoin currently. There's Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core. Uh, the average fee on Bitcoin Core at the moment is about $20, and that's just insane. And if, you have a tra if you're running a business like, like I am with Bitcoin.com and we receive payments all, you know, every day, all day from all sorts of customers um, – I, I was converting more Bitcoin into Bitcoin Cash yesterday, and I was paying on average about $1,000 per transaction to get my, my transactions to the exchanges because I had a bunch of inputs from different advertisers that had paid us you know, $100 or $500 or $200 at a time. And so when you go to move that uh, as a batch, you know, I was paying about $1,000 to move $20,000 worth of you know, Bitcoin Core. 
that's insane. I can't wait to convert those Bitcoins to Bitcoin Cash, whereas the average Bitcoin Cash transaction fee is about a penny at the moment. So if you have a one version of Bitcoin that costs $20 and takes hours or days for it to get confirmed, and you have another version of Bitcoin that costs a penny to use it, and it gets confirmed in the very next block, and you don't have to worry about double spending in the interim, of course businesses are going to use Bitcoin Cash. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. And I remember... In the earliest days of Bitcoin, when I was you know, basically the only person in the world shouting at the top of my lungs about Bitcoin and how this is going to change everything, lots of people called me stupid and said, you're an idiot. Why are people ever going to use that? Uh, nobody's going to use this stupid magic internet money. And sure enough, Bitcoin today is this worldwide phenomenon. And the same is true of Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash, uh, I'm pretty darn confident, is going to become the top dog version of Bitcoin here in the very near future. Uh, due to having a better user experience for everybody. So it doesn't matter if 100% of Bitcoin core users are running full nodes and the fees are $20 or $50 or $100 each. Uh, people aren't going to use that. Businesses aren't going to use that. Businesses are going to build on top of Bitcoin Cash. Uh, and that's what we're going to see happen right before our eyes. And we're already starting to see that happen. So uh, absolutely no doubt in my mind. Yeah, I had forgotten the second part to my question, and that's why I stumbled there uh, a minute ago. Uh, my second part was, do you think these high fees on the original Bitcoin then are being done intentionally then, uh, kind of raising the price, forcing the price higher, maybe so the Bitcoin miners then don't have additional competition from smaller players? No, that's a bunch of nonsense. And I, I've heard people like Trace Mayer and this and that claim it's a spam attack. It's not a spam attack. It's people wanting to use the Bitcoin network, and by definition, if they're willing to pay the fee on the Bitcoin network, it's not spam. It's a use case. So uh, we've seen all of these businesses and layer two protocols been driven away from Bitcoin by these toxic Bitcoin core people that openly say that they want the fees to be high. They want the blocks to be full. They want the horrible user experience that those things cause. Well, guess what? When you create a horrible user experience, people are going to use something else. And we've seen that happen with the birth of Bitcoin Cash. And even Vitalik, when he was considering uh, making Ethereum in the early days, he looked at the, the Bitcoin core group and what they were wanting to do with Bitcoin with these full block policy, and he decided not to build Ethereum on top of Bitcoin. Imagine if we had had people that wanted to be inclusive and allow people to build things on top of Bitcoin. All of that infrastructure and all that wonderful stuff that's happening on top of Ethereum would have been happening on top of Bitcoin instead. But thanks to Bitcoin Cash, I think we're going to see a lot of that uh, diversity uh, and, and infrastructure coming back to, to Bitcoin Cash. Very interesting comments there. Speaking of Vitalik and Ethereum, uh, are, are you speculating Ethereum? Do you think Ethereum has any uh, any is viable competition to Bitcoin then? Absolutely, uh, it's viable competition. And it's worth pointing out that Bitcoin didn't have any viable competition until these economic ignoramuses openly called for Bitcoin's blocks to be full, which causes the fees to be high, which causes the transactions to be unreliable, which causes a horrible user experience. And it wasn't until that started to happen with Bitcoin that these altcoins got any traction at all. Before that happened, altcoin, nobody paid any attention to altcoins. It was all about Bitcoin. Whereas now today, the altcoins are really chomping at Bitcoin's tail. And you better watch out. Bitcoin, uh, if it wasn't for Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin would have been surpassed by Ethereum and some of these other things here in the very near future. So if you don't provide users with a good user experience, people are going to use something else. And the the supporters of Bitcoin Core are openly hostile to users of Bitcoin. They're openly hostile to the businesses that allow millions of people around the world to use Bitcoin. Well, guess what? If you're openly hostile to people who want to use Bitcoin, they're not going to use it anymore. They're going to switch to Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum or Monero or Dash or take your pick. Or they're going to switch to the currency that provides a good user experience. Now, uh, for people who are bullish on Ethereum, I hear them always mention about smart contracts. But when I research smart contracts more, I hear that they can't do very much right right now, right yet. They're basically dumb contracts that can only do a couple things. Have you actually done a smart contract yet? Um, so my background isn't so much in smart contracts. I'm much, much more interested in the monetary characteristics of cryptocurrencies and why they become became useful as money. And uh, Bitcoin Cash is much, much, much more likely to be useful as money in the future than Bitcoin SegWit is. And uh, so that's where my interest is. And, bit, and at the same time, though, Bitcoin Cash is much, use, much, much, much more useful for people who want to build smart contracts and things like that on top of it because it's a penny a transaction instead of $20 a transaction. So we'll see a lot more uh, innovation on Bitcoin Cash on, on that front as well. It's very interesting. Are, are you actually speculating on any of the top 100 altcoins uh, or are you just, uh, like you said earlier, mostly uh, in Bitcoin Cash now? You've been moving away from Bitcoin Core and in into Bitcoin Cash. 
So I'd never, ever, ever bought any altcoins at all until I became scared of Blockstream and Bitcoin Core's intentional degradation of the Bitcoin network and their their intent to cause it to have a bad user experience by intentionally creating high fees and intentionally creating full blocks and the unreliable Bitcoin transactions that they cause. When I saw that these people were trying to do those things with Bitcoin and engaging in a massive censorship campaign in order to accomplish those goals, I started speaking out every chance I could against those goals that are detrimental to the adoption of Bitcoin. And I hedged my bets by buying some altcoins for the first time. So I bought some Zcash, I bought some Zcoin, I bought some Monero, I bought some Dash, I, I bought some Ethereum. Um, I bought, and there's probably one or two others that I'm forgetting uh, out there, but I, I have a, a basket of cryptocurrencies at this point because it would be stupid to put all your eggs in one basket. I hear Adam back out there saying that I should buy 100% Bitcoin cash. That's retarded. Don't take your investment advice from anybody that tells you to put all your eggs in one basket. Anybody that tells you to put all your eggs in one basket either is intentionally giving you bad advice or uh, is economically ignorant themselves. They have no clue if they're telling you to put all your eggs in one basket. That's stupid. And even when it comes to cryptocurrencies, don't put all of your wealth in a basket of cryptocurrencies either. Have some real estate, have some stocks, have some other savings out there. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket in anything in life. That's horrible advice. And anybody that's giving you such advice is uh, is misguided or, or intentionally uh, giving you bad advice because they're a bad person. It's one of those two things. I completely agree. And also, Roger, I think it's human nature that uh, a lot of people initially, whether it was computer programmers or li especially the libertarian crowd, you know, they were in gold and silver. Uh, they uh, found out about cryptocurrencies a few years ago, maybe 2010 or 11. They were told about it. So if you didn't have a technology background, you didn't know what it was. And then they see these things are going up in gold and silver and mining shares are not because they're manipulated. So now a lot of people listen to my podcast have liquidated their physical gold, their physical silver and their mining shares. They're not diversified or their diversification like you said is to only own a couple different cryptocurrencies now because they're going up yeah diversity the diversity is is the key for any investment portfolio so don't put all your eggs in one basket that's fantastic advice for for not just investing but for any area of life now, I want to ask you a question as a libertarian. Are, are you worried that uh, these governments will take the will hijack the blockchain technology, all the technologies behind uh, behind all these fantastic cryptocurrency innovations for a cashless society to track and tax every single economic transaction? Yes, I'm very worried about that. So that's why my goal from day one when I got involved in Bitcoin was to spread adoption as far and wide as quickly as I possibly could so that everybody around the world is using Bitcoin to buy their coffee. Mo uh, mo mothers are using Bitcoin to buy their diapers and, and baby formula so that everybody's using Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for every single transaction. If we can make that happen as fast as we possibly can, it'll be too late for the regulators because regulators and lawmakers move very, very slowly. We need to move fast so that we have Bitcoin has replaced the euro, the dollar, and the yen worldwide before the regulators even know what happened. So that's that's been my goal from day one. And unfortunately, these blockstream people openly say that they don't want these big businesses using Bitcoin. They don't want mass adoption of Bitcoin. They want Bitcoin to stay some you know, relatively small niche product. And that's the exact opposite strategy of what we should have. We should move as quickly as we possibly can to have as many people around the world using Bitcoin as fast as we possibly can. And when I say Bitcoin at this point, I'm referring to Bitcoin Cash, the true Bitcoin. And if you don't believe me or disagree, go and read the Bitcoin white paper. It's clear which version of Bitcoin is the one that's uh, outlined in the in the Bitcoin white paper. There's a lot of people all, all over the globe, Roger, I know you travel a lot, who uh, love technology, who see all the potential benefits of uh, cryptocurrency and uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And yet, you know, they don't believe in Austrian school economics. They're not libertarian. They don't understand, you know, the history of governments and the oppression that governments can do. And so, you know, some of these governments, I think Canada is one of the first. I think they're they're not that far away from implementing a fully digital society where cash is going to be banned. So, you know, you're going to be forced to spend your Canadian dollars with your check, your uh, your debit card, and you're not going to be able to use cash. So, uh, you know, the governments uh, are, are working on these uh, to take the blockchain technology, whether it's uh, – I think there's a couple of European countries. I think India is also testing this out. And I know Canada is also working on pushing this forward as well. Yeah, well, I invite you all to go and buy some cryptocurrencies now. And once uh, they have enough adoption around the world, you'll have enough wealth where you can come and uh, basically buy a home in this wonderful island of St. Kitts, which is where I am right now. And uh, you buy a home here and you get citizenship along with it. And St. Kitts has 
absolutely no personal income tax, absolutely no uh, capital gains tax. You don't even have to file a tax return at the end of the year. So uh, feel free to come and join me in St. Kitts for anybody that's interested in that sort of thing. I want to ask you about uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, since I enjoy their website and their content so much. Uh, how did you find the Austrian School of Economics and uh, FEE? Um, so when I was a high school student, I think it was my grandfather, or some somewhere, somehow along the line, I got a hold of a copy of uh, the Freeman, which was their monthly newsletter. And I was reading the Freeman as a high school student. And then from there, I found laissez-faire books and then was ordering more and more you know, free market economics books. And the more economics books I, I read, the more and more of a libertarian I became. And I, I certainly wasn't born that way. And uh, then when I got my hands on some Murray Rothbard books, I, I guess I went all the way down the road to being a, a voluntarist at that point. And uh, so it was thanks to the Freeman publication that I found the Foundation for Economic Education. And then for those that don't know, back in 2011 – when Bitcoin was about $10, the media and everybody else was calling Bitcoin a scam and a bubble and a Ponzi scheme and that it was going to go to nothing. And so I made a video betting on the internet publicly on YouTube saying that I thought Bitcoin was going to outperform the U.S. stock market, gold, silver, and the U.S. dollar over the next two years. Not just outperform them, but outperform them by more than 100 times. And I bet $10,000 that that would be the case. And two years came and went and Bitcoin didn't quite do that. It actually took like two years and two months and at that point, the price of Bitcoin went from $10 to over $1,000. And so I donated 1,000 Bitcoins at the time to the Foundation of Economic Education, which was worth a little less than $1.2 million at the time of the donation. Uh, today would be worth, what, about uh, about $8 million uh, had I held on to those. But uh, I don't regret it at all one bit because the Foundation for Economic Education is a fantastic organization that spreads uh, you know, economic education to people all over the world. And uh, that's what made me see the world so much more clearly. And it was thanks to their books and their publications that I was able to recognize the importance of Bitcoin so much earlier than most people around the world. And that's why I became the first person in the entire world to start investing in Bitcoin startups and became such a a passionate uh, proponent of of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because they economically liberate everybody on the entire planet. And the economic freedom uh, increases the rate of economic growth and the rate of economic growth is what improves everybody's standard of living all over the planet, rich and poor alike. So our entire goal should be increasing the rate of economic growth all over the world. And the best tool we have to do that is economic freedom. And uh, the Foundation for Economic uh, Education is the best tool that I'm aware of, second only to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, to spreading uh, the the ideas of economic uh, freedom and liberty. Yeah, I believe Henry Hazlitt, who's one of my favorite writers, wrote one of my favorite books, Economics in One Lesson. I believe he founded the Foundation for Economic Education, and they have a lot of good articles on there about a lot of current events topics. So it's very interesting uh, for people who haven't read, you know, the more I, I saw that uh, you had read Mises' uh, socialism book, but, you know, obviously that's not a beginner's book. So for people who are looking to start off uh, beginners, they should probably start off reading fee articles. I completely agree. And and once again, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt is a fantastic book. And you read that and you'll start to see the whole world in a different light. Uh, It's fantastic. So I highly recommend anybody that's interested in these ideas pick up that book. And it's a very, very easy to read book. Uh, He's an excellent writer and the the concepts are easy to understand in the ways that he presents them. Now, uh, you've talked publicly in the last couple of months about your free society project. It, It sounds very interesting. How far along is this? Um, it's pretty far along. We already have more than $100 million of uh, private capital invested uh, or committed to it. And uh, we're working with the lawyers to figure out how we can allow the public to participate. We're already in talks with a couple of different governments around the world. So it's very far along. And hopefully by this time uh, next year, we'll be able to say exactly where it's going to be and, and how everything's going to go. So we're we're moving full speed ahead with that. Is this going to be similar to uh, Doug Casey's Cafajete or uh, the attempt at in uh, Chile for Gold Gulch? So I'm not as familiar with those projects, although my understanding is that they were just trying to build kind of an enclave of like-minded thinkers within the existing government. Whereas with our Free Society project, we're trying to buy a big chunk of land from an existing government and have that government not just sell us the land but grant us sovereignty with that land. And from there, we'll set up the world's very first non-country where there won't be any monopoly on government. There won't be any monopoly on the use of force. We'll set up the initial constitution and then the free market and and human beings and voluntary interactions will figure out the best way to solve their problems. And at the end of the day, we don't know exactly how they'll they'll set up the society to do that. But uh, it'll be without the same amount of uh, violence and coercion that we have with traditional governments around the world. 
Yeah, it sounds like a, a great idea, but, you know, after it becomes prosperous, Roger, you know, the governments are going to want to try to steal it. <laughs> yeah, well, cryptocurrencies provide a, a tool to help provide for national defense as well in a decentralized uh, uh, manner that wasn't possible before the invention of cryptocurrencies. So that's pretty exciting as well. And cryptocurrencies, Roger, are also, you know, preventing people from starving to death. I mean, look at in the current events, look at what's happening in Venezuela. I think there's 100,000 Bitcoin miners now, over 100,000 in in Venezuela who are, you know, going and mining Bitcoin and doing it to buy food online for their families because the government has totally screwed up the economy there. And look at what Mugabe has done in Zimbabwe. I'm sure they're mining Bitcoin there as well. Yeah, and I'm sure that most of those people are no longer looking at using uh, Bitcoin Core because of the $20 per transaction fees. That's a lot of money for, for most people in most of the world. We've actually, at Bitcoin.com, we've uh, laid the groundwork now for a big outreach project to people in Venezuela where we're going to give out uh, Bitcoin Cash to people there and Bitcoin Cash wallets and show them how to use it because it's the real true Bitcoin that's true to the original version of Bitcoin that was to allow everybody on the planet to be able to use it with anybody else. Uh, and for anything, you know, a penny or more is supposed to be on chain. And uh, it'll support layer two technologies, too. We're not opposed to that. But uh, there's no reason to strangle this goose that's been laying the golden egg, which is exactly what Blockstream and the core developers have done with Bitcoin. And uh, I think before we know it, we're going to see uh, they're either going to have to hard proof, uh, hard fork the proof of work to something else or their chain is going to die because Bitcoin Cash is going to eat their lunch alive by providing a better user experience for people around the world that are using it. For, for a new listener out there who hasn't maybe bought any Bitcoin yet, uh, how long would it take them to go to Bitcoin.com and, you know, get a wallet and start buying Bitcoins? Maybe 10 minutes. Uh, you go over there and the first step is to get a wallet and the next step is to buy some Bitcoin. You can do that with a credit card right now. Unfortunately, you're going to pay the $20 fee because it's only Bitcoin SegWit that we have available on there. But within the next couple of weeks, we'll have Bitcoin Cash available for a credit card as well. Uh, you can also, once you have the Bitcoin, you can then use a website like shapeshift.io to convert it to Bitcoin Cash. Uh, our wallet supports both Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash today. In the next couple of days, we'll be pushing another release that has the Bitcoin Cash portion of the wallet be much, much, much more prominent than the Bitcoin Core version uh, or portion of the wallet. So everybody can look forward to that as well. Very cool. And we, we know from, from the past financial history that governments, you know, when something goes up a lot, they often like to change the rules on something. They tried to do this with gold during the gold, last gold bull market. They try to put windfall profits tax on those. They try to put windfall profits tax on oil miners. Do you, do you expect the U.S. government to try to put windfall profits taxes on people who are making lots of money on uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? There's a good chance that they'll do that because if you think about it, all throughout history, all the governments do is they look for who has the money and then they take it. And so uh, if they think that cryptocurrency holders have a bunch of money, governments will do their best that they can to take it. But uh, unlike physical gold or silver or money in your bank account, it's much, much, much more difficult for governments to seize people's cryptocurrencies. I completely agree. Yeah, I think that's why, uh, you know, earlier we talked about diversification. I think that's why diversification is important because uh, unfortunately, you know, we live in a dystopian uh, technological society now where governments can basically change the rules every day if they want going forward. Well, that's what it means to be a government. You get to make your own rules and nobody can ever tell you that you're wrong. Well, unless there's a bigger government, it's like the, you know, the goldfish thing. <laughs> That's true. Look at, look at North, North Korea is issuing rules, but, you know, now that, like, Trump's threatening to uh, nuke them or, or do a weapons test on them with new weapons, I'm sure, like, they'll at least think about backing down. But, yeah, the average, the average guy is uh, at victim there because the governments are the ones with most of the guns. And it's worth keeping in mind, though, too, that the people in North Korea have even less of a say as to what, you know, Kim Jong-un and, and their government people are doing than, than Americans do with what Trump is doing. So we should feel ca compassion towards these poor people in North Korea that are having such a horrible, horrible life because of the government there. I mean, the U.S. government does all sorts of horrible, horrible things. So does the North Korean government and uh, arguably even more so. So uh, have compassion for these people that are they're victims of this thing. Don't uh, Don't advocate for dropping nukes on them. Great point. I don't think any government, Roger, at this point, really, for pretty much all the big countries and economies is doing a good job. I mean, a lot of them are trying to devalue their currency. They're bailing out bankers. They're letting, you know, politicians and corporate executives get away with fraud and felonies and a bunch of other crimes. So, um, you know, corruption's in a bull market. And uh, this, this is the world we live in, unfortunately. You know, there's, uh, we're a minority as uh, libertarians in Austrian school. 
yeah, but thanks to the internet and cryptocurrencies, we have this amazing platform to help spread our ideas. And I think it's pretty clear that our, our ideas are the correct ones. All, all human interactions should be on a voluntary basis. Austrians understand uh, what money is more. That's why so many people that were attracted to Bitcoin early on were from the Austrian School of Economics. And they weren't a bunch of Keynesians. And uh, the fact that Bitcoin has now you know, become this worldwide phenomenon is uh, uh, an example that the Austrians do have a better understanding of money. So uh, let's use these platforms that we have now to spread these ideas to to more people around the world and make a better place, uh, make the world a better place. Thanks to these ideas. Yeah. There's, there's some Austrians out there that are in favor of only gold and silver standards, but I'm in favor of crypto. I'm in favor of, uh, competing currencies, you know, let all these different things, gold, silver, Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash, let all these things compete in the marketplace and let the market figure out which one is best for different things rather than, that's, you know, these governments. That's exactly legal- right. And we're going to see that happen between Bitcoin core and Bitcoin cash here. And it's already, clear bitcoin cash has only been around for what uh, a month and a half now two months something like that and it's already uh there's the bounce between the second and third most popular cryptocurrency in the world by market cap i think uh it's gonna really really uh surprise a lot of people that think that you know why would anybody ever use anything other than bitcoin core well the market's going to decide at the end of the day and uh when you have one cryptocurrency that's super slow and expensive and unreliable and you have bitcoin cash that's super cheap fast and reliable it's clear which one people are going to use. And I, I didn't mean to talk over you there, but uh, I think it's worth pointing that out. No worries. I'm, I'm glad to get your insights. And I look forward to you coming back on my show to give updates on Bitcoin Cash. You know, we're we're in a really incredible time in history now because, you know, I, I think Bitcoin, Roger, I'm not sure if you would agree with this, but I think I would still say that Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies are still an experiment. But, you know, for seven years now, it's been a successful experiment and it is very exciting to see all this innovation occur right in front of us. I agree. They're all, they're all still experimental, but the experiments are becoming more and more reliable and more and more useful. And uh, out of this Darwinian evolution of cryptocurrencies, some really, really powerful tools for human liberation are going to uh, evolve and emerge. Well, Roger, I want to thank you again for your time today. If our listeners want to follow your updates on Bitcoin Cash or the cryptocurrency space, how did they do so? Uh, Bitcoin.com, and as we uh, put out on our press release there, uh, from our point of view at this point, Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin. So uh, come on over to Bitcoin.com to learn more. Wall Street for Main Street needs your help. Since the middle of 2016, YouTube continues to increasingly censor and sabotage the growth and success of my channel with dramatically slower or no subscriber growth. A huge decrease in views per month compared to 2016 and well over $10,000 lost in Google AdSense revenues the last 18 months. I should have been way over 20,000 subscribers and way over 3 million views last year, but it feels like I am Sisyphus trying to roll a heavier boulder with more and more additional weight up a steeper and steeper hill. In the last few weeks, all of my videos have been set to demonetization by default, and I have to manually protest each video. This is in addition to even lower than usual Google AdSense revenues after the adpocalypse started over a year ago for me. This has also affected my ability to get paid advertisers to agree to deals not involving YouTube as I lost three grand per month in paid advertising deals at the end of June 2017 because all my analytics are down a lot thanks to YouTube censorship algorithms that have intentionally kneecapped the growth of my channel. With YouTube slash Google slash Alphabet slash don't be evil, strongly considering demonetizing or setting all libertarian, conservative, or pro-Trump content to private to prevent any sharing or monetization, it is imperative I have a contingency plan to figure out how to make a living off my content. Each 30 to 40 minute video takes a few hours of my time before it's released to the public. There's a strong possibility that in the near future, YouTube will force me to move all or almost all my content to a new video upload website that allows free speech or behind a paywall on my own website. Thanks if you have already made a one-time or recurring monthly donation, and thanks in advance for any future donations as I decide the future of my channel and what to do with my content going forward. We accept one-time donations on the Wall Street for Main Street website via PayPal, Bitcoin, or gold money. You can also become a monthly Patreon contributor for a buck or more a month if you want to help me out. And don't forget to like each video on YouTube and share it with your friends and family if you think they they would like the content.